and we're going to talk about EPS. So, um, with regard to EPS, EPS is simply a measure, right? So, it is a measure of performance. It is a measure that we provide for investors. Um, and basically, it's not, it's unlike any other sections where we're doing some sort of um, calculation and journal entries. This specific section, right, so just the EPS section, there aren't really journal entries because we're not recording anything new. Instead, we are simply presenting and disclosing information. So it's, it's simply, it's entirely a disclosure uh, section. Um, However, in order for us to get this disclosure and to get it right, we will need to do a few calculations. Now, I'm going to walk you through those calculations today. I'm going to walk you through the first part of the calculations. And um, yeah, and so that's, that's basically what we're going to be doing today. In terms of the lecture, the first part of the lecture will be a little bit fast paced. And that's just because I want to get through all of the introductory stuff until we get to the actual calculation, which I want to spend a little bit more time on and go a little bit slowly. Um, so if you are confused about the introductory parts of EPS, then I would suggest that you go back and watch this video. But uh, for the most part, it's very self-explanatory, the, the first few parts. So looking at our agenda for today, um, so like I said, at the beginning, we're just going to do a few introductions. I'm going to go over like what we need to know before we exit this uh, topic. Um, and then we want to just set the stand why EPS is um, necessary. Why do we need to record EPS? And, um, you know, what do we need to comply with, right? And then Finally, in today's lecture, in the last part of the lecture, the part that is important for us to like pay super, to be very careful and, and pay a lot of attention to, um, we're going to go through the numerator as well as the denominator. And, and we're going to look at for value and not for value shares, right? Um, and so that's the part that I really want to get to because that's the part that, that's important for our tests uh, and exams. Um, okay, so in terms of where do you find the day, the, the, this work, right? so you're not going to find it in your green textbooks, right, guys? So it's not there. Please um, don't look there, right? I, I can guarantee you that there's going to be, unfortunately, some student that hasn't come to the lecture, and they're going to start looking for it in the green textbook. It's not there. Um, the only source that you've been provided with and the only source that you need is your class notes so i have gone through numerous textbooks and looked at it myself and gone through the standard the ias 33 standard and combined with sort of what notes were existing in the module so last year's notes i i added to them and reworded some things for explanation purposes and um, then I, I put it on ClickUp. So those notes are going to really assist you. They're really going to help you. So I want you to treat those notes as your primary source of data, your primary source of information and instruction. Um, and so they are already on ClickUp. When you go into the EPS section, there's going to be a part there for class notes. And so please download them um, and read through them. They are the key to you passing this uh, section. The other thing is your class slides, the way we've done the class slides is it's a summary of the class notes, just like with, with uh, Share Capital. If you remember Share Capital, the slides were quite detailed. Um, and so here as well, the slides are going to be very important uh, and they're going to give you a good summary of what uh, you need to know. If you uh, are in a situation where um, you can download or print out the slides and then use them as the basis for your notes, I would suggest that you do that. It's not necessary, and I don't want to put anyone out in terms of cost, but uh, it, it would be an idea that, that I would um, support, basically. Um, in terms of our questions, you're going to find all of your questions in Chapter 14. Now, for the end of today and for tomorrow's lecture, I want us to try and attempt uh, 14. Point one and 14.2. So please um, try and do that this evening. 
so that we are prepared for tomorrow's lecture. Um, also on ClickUp, I've got a number of examples, right? Um, those examples are super, super important. So make sure that you download those examples and bring them and have them ready when, when we have our next, le next lecture. I almost said bring them to class, but we're not in class. So um, yeah, so just have them ready for the next lecture. So stuff that we're not doing, right? So you would remember that when, we, when so this slide is basically highlighting all the stuff we're not doing. So um, you remember when we went over share capital, we spoke about all of these different types of, of, of things. We spoke about participating preference shares, share splits and share consolidations, et cetera, and also mandatory um, convertible instruments. And remember we said when they're mandatory or compulsory convertible, they have that element of, of liability in them because they, they, they almost feel like a loan. So we're not gonna deal with those. Um, and we're also not going to deal with what's called a combination issue, something that is partly issued for cash, where you receive some cash, but you don't receive a fair value. Okay, so we're not going to deal with that, but I'll explain that a little bit further later on. Um, the one important thing that I want to tell you is that these sections have been excluded for this year. However, in the prior years, they may have been included. Right, so they may have been tested. So when you're going through your prior test papers and exam papers and preparing for your tests uh, this year, please be aware that we're not covering these specific topics. So, so if you find these things in your exam paper, you're going to have to try and amend them and amend the question and the answer for it to exclude the preference shares and and share splits, etc. Okay. Um, then, so like I said, I'm going a little bit fast through these slides because they're very basic. Uh, but so we're going to have a few abbreviations that we're going to use in class. Now, the problem is um, these abbreviations are going to become second nature to us. So I want us to get them down and understand them clearly the first time around. Okay. Um, so for example, basic earnings per share you'll often hear me say it's eps and you guys will, will start picking up on that and you'll also start referring to basic earnings per share as eps so that's our first abbreviation um now there's a thing called diluted earnings per share it's a type of it's a type of basic earnings per share that's more futuristic or looking into the future and so um uh, when we are we refer to that uh, diluted earnings per share we'll say DEPS. Sometimes you'll find that uh, in the lecture, I will emphasize the word diluted or I'll emphasize the letter D just to make sure that you are aware that I'm referring to diluted earnings per share. But generally with that one, because I'm scared that we might get confused, I like to say the full, full word out and say um, diluted earnings per share, right? So um, that is DEPS. Then D PS, so I notice I left out the D uh, and left out the E. So DPS is dividends per share. Again, because I don't want us to get too, co too confused with these two, I generally will say dividends per share um, just to help us with that. But but when you see it in your tests, in your questions or your past tests, then you know exactly what they're talking about when they say DPS versus DEPS. Um, then now this one I like, and this one you're going to hear a lot, WANOS, right? I like the word WANOS. It's a strange word. And so that's why you'll often find me using it in class. Um, what it basically means is weighted average number of ordinary shares, right? So I won't, I won't say that entire statement. I'll generally say WANOS. Um, it's a very strange word. And so that's why I like using it. Um, hopefully you guys also think it's strange. Um, then when I use the word earnings, when I use the word earnings here, um, it seems like my internet connection is poor. Can everyone hear me clearly? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm on campus, so I have no idea why it would be poor. Okay. So when I'm talking about earnings, right? I'm referring to profit, right? Profit 
attributable to ordinary shareholders. We're going to get into this definition a little bit more and we're going to break it down for us uh, for, and then hopefully we understand it a little bit better, right? But these are just the abbreviations that I want us to be aware of. Okay, so in terms of what we need to know by the end of this topic, so this topic is eight lectures long, um, so basically two weeks. So what do we need to know at the end of it? Um, it's important that we understand the different definitions. I'm going to take you through the definitions. I'm going to break them down, but we must be able to understand and apply the definitions. Um, and then uh, part of that me means that we need to calculate what we call earnings, right? Uh, which is the first part of, of the, the uh, basic earnings per share. And then also WANOS, which is the second part, right? So WANOS and earnings will be used in both basic and diluted earnings per share. We're just gonna change the numbers a little bit for each one. So, um, but I'll walk you through that. And then, um, so this is important for, for today's lecture. We're going to be focusing in on the end of the lecture. We have an understanding of why we need to wait something, right? What is the purpose of waiting? Now, what is another word for waiting? So, so you find the standard always talks about waiting, 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 and uh, or waited, and then uh, students get confused, right? Waiting is another word for a portion. Uh, um, so, a portion, the word that I popped in the in the uh, chat now. A portion is something that I think you guys are more familiar with. It it uh, we sometimes use it when we talking about PPE, it's simply just breaking something up into its into its parts based on some rule, right? So I'm going to talk to you about that rule. Um, then we're going to try and look at why certain amounts are restated and, and what is the purpose of restating. We want, we want to get into the rationale and the understanding of what restating uh, means. Finally, we're going to do uh, dividends per share, which is not difficult but i will show you what it's all about it's super easy that's probably the one that we're going to score all the marks on and then uh, lastly we're just going to do a little bit of disclosure okay so that's what we want to know by the end of of this lecture okay so if we have a look at uh, eps right now now let me uh, put you in the picture right so we've got different types of companies listed on the jc and let's say you are an investor and you're trying to invest in a company right um, now, you've got different companies. So you've got, let's say, Grinrod, which is um, a shipping and clearing agency. Uh, then you've got Mr. Price, for example. And Mr. Price, we all know what they do. They sell um, clothes. Um, then you've got, let's say, uh, Woolworths, which sells both clothes and groceries. And then let's say you've got like a mining company, um, Impala Platinum, for example. So now you've got these, these different companies, these four different companies. And if you were to ask someone, you know, which company are you going to invest in? The comparison between these four companies becomes extremely complex. And the reason why it becomes so complex is because we've got different companies at different life stages in their, in their lives, but they're also in different industries. Um, they're innovating at different rates and, and even the, the, the space for innovation might be different. For example, like how much more innovation can you bring into a mine? Um, you know, it might not be a lot, but in terms of shopping, you can do, you know, uh, shopping on, online and delivery. So, so there's different uh, characteristics for each entity. Um, so the problem is we need some way to compare them, right? So that's the first thing. Then the next thing is, and the next, so, so let's leave that point uh, aside and let's look at point two. The second thing is from year to year, in a given entity, different things will happen. So for example, um, you know, uh, Mr. Price will buy Miladies, let's say, right? So Mr. Price owns Miladies. And if you have a look at their financial statements, Miladies has been making a loss. So now on year one, Miladies made a loss, but then the, uh, the previous year they had bought Miladies. And so now there's all the stuff that's happening. And so it can be confusing from year to year even. So what we do is we calculate this thing called earnings per share and diluted earnings per share to give us some sort of measure, a, a comparison 
between the different types of companies in different industries, right? So it must go across industries, but also be in the same company across years, right? We want something so that we can compare one year to the next and one year of performance to a different entity. So we're looking for a measure that can do that. And EPS tries, uh, I wouldn't say it achieves it, but it tries to, to create that comparability um, between companies and also between years, okay? Um, so just briefly why we need to have it is because people need to make investment decisions, obviously, right? So with basic earnings per share, uh, it's a good a basic measure. That's why it's called basic earnings per share. It's a good starting measure for us to make economic decisions, for us to decide whether this company is providing good profits and good revenue, uh, whether this company is stable across different years, et cetera, right? So it, it provides us with a basis, a, a, a starting point. Uh, with diluted earnings per share, diluted earnings per share has an element of forward looking, right? So it, it looks into the future. And it, and it tries to predict what might happen, right? It does that specifically by looking at shares, right? So ordinary shares, and it says, what might happen with the ordinary shares in the future? And let's see if, if it happened this year, how would our basic earnings per share change? So diluted earnings per share is aiming to change or reduce, um, to change or reduce basic earnings per share for future events okay so that's the basic idea uh, dividends per share is a very simple measure it's just saying you know how much dividends is each shareholder getting that's the basic uh, um, breakdown of dividends per share and i think for the most part we are familiar with sort of you know uh, we've got ten thousand shares in issue and each one gets um 10 cents Per share, that's dividends per share. Just give me one minute. I just want to have a sip of water. I'll do that now. Okay. So these measures aim to produce some sort of compatibility for us. Okay. So let's have a look at at how they do that. But before we we get into the calculation, we um, we want to look at why companies would do it. So, so what, which companies do it and why? So firstly, the JSE, companies listed on Johannesburg Stock Exchange, are forced to actually uh, prepare earnings per share. And that's because the JSE requires it as a listing requirement. Listing requirement means before you list on the JSE, you have to meet the requirement. They don't allow you to list unless you uh, prepare uh, EPS and DPS um, for at least five years. The other thing is that um, the standard, so IAS 13, indicates and says that if a sh company has shares that are purchased and traded by the public, right? Public meaning people that are unrelated to the entity, unrelated to the company. If that is the case, then uh, they, they must present uh, EPS and DPS, right? So they must comply with the standard. Um, and so the, the, the important thing there is that if a company uh, prepares EP and DPS and they not and they don't meet these requirements, what they're in effect doing is they're voluntarily choosing to, to, to prepare it. Okay, so uh, for, for the most part, all of the questions that you get are going to have a company with, with the, with the um, uh, the name limited at the end, right? So limited is in the name. So you'll see it's like, um, um, you know, whatever the company's name limited. So that tells us that it's a public company. So it's easy for South Africans because South Africans can easy, easily identify which companies are public companies based on their name. So all of our questions and everything that you get in the test and exam will all be limited companies. And therefore we all have to prepare, uh, they, they would have to comply with the um, standard. Okay, so now let's quickly look at uh, basic earnings per share. Okay, so just this is just a recap from Tuesday. Remember in, uh, in Tuesday's lecture, we spoke about um, ordinary shares and we said they're the most subordinate class and generally they have access to, to the profits 
last, right? And then in the case of liquidation, they also have access to the um, proceeds from liquidation last. So they are the most subordinate shares, uh, but they also have voting rights. So in essence, ordinary shares are true equity, true owners, true equity owners, because they are a, they take a whole lot of risk uh, and they also make decisions in the company. So because of that mix, it makes them very much like a true equity. And then we've got, we spoke about uh, convertible instruments. Now, remember, we're not dealing with compulsory or mandatory convertible instruments. We're just talking about those other convertible instruments that we dealt with, where we said, you know, it can be converted at the option of the uh, holder or at the option of the company. So those are the ones we want to focus on. But convertible instruments, um, because they can be converted into ordinary shares in the future, right? So they're not ordinary shares now but they can be converted into ordinary shares in the future, they will have what's called a dilutive effect, right? So they, it means you're making it smaller. They would have a dilutive effect on earnings because um, what in effect is happening is you're getting more shareholders, more ordinary shareholders. And therefore the, the amount that each shareholder can get and, and the right to, the amount that they have the right to now gets smaller because there's more people but the pie hasn't necessarily gotten bigger, for example. So they will have what's called a dilutive effect. And that dilutive effect will be taken into account when we calculate diluted earnings per share. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is earnings, right? So see the word that's on the screen now, right? So we've got earnings and we say it is the profit or loss, right? Profit or loss um, attributable to ordinary shares uh, in issue, okay? So now let's ask a few questions and you guys are gonna answer in the chat for me. So get ready. The first question is, um, does it take into account OCI? Now, now uh, while you think about the answer, of this of that question think about how we set out the income statement we have a profit and then we have oci and then we have total comprehensive income so when i say it's profit or loss are we taking into account oci or not pop your answer into the chat what do you think is it a yes or a no are we taking into account oci or not if i say profit or loss profit or loss Okay. Okay. There we go. Some people are getting it right. So, um, so because we're saying profit, right, uh, and we're not saying total comprehensive income, because we're saying profit, we automatically excluding OCI, right? Because the idea is that we want to show the investors what is coming out of the operations of the company. And remember, OCI, the defining factor around OCI is that it's not from the normal day-to-day -day operations, right? Stuff that's from the normal day-to-day -day operations is like sales and cost of sales. So there's, they're already sitting in profit, right? It's already taken into account in profit. But OCI is, is got that other element, like it's uh, outside the normal business practice. So therefore, it's not taking into account OCI. Uh, when I say ordinary shares, um, so I'm obviously excluding, right? So I'm taking out the preference shares, Okay, that makes sense because it clearly says ordinary shares. So it's obviously not preference shares. It's also not debentures, obviously, right? Because I'm saying ordinary shares, so it can't be debentures. But what other thing is it excluding? What other thing is it excluding? It's excluding um, preference shares and debentures. It's excluding something else that Mr. Lambon uh, taught us, something else. Uh, um, what other type of owner can you have in a company? You can have preference share owner. You can have um, you can have debentures, debenture holders. They're not really owners, but so you can have debenture holders. Then you can have ordinary shares, and then there's another type of of um, person that you can have in a company. What what is that? Mr. Lambon was was teaching us about that that person or those people. 
There we go. Someone's got it. So the answer is NCI. Okay. So when we talk about ordinary shares, we automatically excluding, we're taking out NCI. So when we're dealing with the earnings figure, right? So the earnings figure, we are taking profit and we're excluding our OCI. And we, when we're taking the, um, and then when we say attributable to ordinary shareholders, we're excluding people like preference shareholders, we're excluding the debenture shareholders, and we're excluding non-controlling interests. Okay. Does everybody understand that? Does everybody understand the reasoning behind it? If you do, please give me a yes in the chat box. Um, okay. Now, the next thing is, EPS is always expressed and disclosed in rands per share, right? So the key is it has to be in rands per share because all the other things in the income statement is in rands per share. For example, you'd have, um, you know, profit in rands per share. You'd have uh, revenue in rands per share. So what happens if we calculate EPS and it comes out to 50 cents? In the chat box, write for me what 50 cents will look like if it was in rands. 50 cents, what will it look like if it was in rands? Pop it in the chat box for me so that we can see what people come up with. There we go. There we go. Yes. So it's 0 0.5, right? 0 0.50. So that is what 50 cents looks like. So please, 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 in your test and exam, never disclose it in cents. It must be in rands per share, right? So it must be in the same, uh, with the same precision that the rest of the income statement is disclosed in. So if it's 50 cents, it's going to be a rand, so R, 0 0.50, okay? Um, very good. And then we said already, we already spoke about the fact that it's only ordinary shares. So not preference shares, not debenture holders, not NCI, only, 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 only ordinary shares. Okay. Um, so WANOS. Right. So WANOS is basically what we're saying is, now, now, now think about this, right, guys? So we've got a company. The company has an opening balance of shares in issue. Let's say we've got 100 shares in issue at the beginning of the year. All right. Now, during the year, we made another issue. Let's say halfway during the year, six months after the year had started, we had another issue. Let's call these the new issued shares. All right. So they were issued newly in the middle of the year. Okay. And we received some money for them. So we received um, some cash. So we issued them for a specific amount of uh, rands per share and we got some cash okay now the company from the company's perspective they've had this new capital for only part of the year okay they have not had it for the entire year okay when they calculate the earnings now so the top amount so when they calculate earnings profit and loss that is a yearly amount does that make sense? So profit is a yearly amount, but the new capital they've only had for part of the year. Okay. So what Wanos does, so Wanos is now the bottom part. What Wanos does is it apportions the number of new shares for the part of the year that they were in issue. Okay. I'll repeat that again. Wanos it would warn us we need to apportion the new shares for the part of the year that they were in issue, right? So that they were in issue. So if something was, let's say, uh, if if our if our year ran from January to December and we issued something in October, one October, how many months has it been in issue? How many months has it been in issue? Pop your answer in the chat. So our, our year runs from January to December, and we issued shares in October. How many months has it been in issue? Three. There we go. It's three months. 
Right. So we would take the number of shares and we'd apportion it for three divided by 12, right? Because it's only been, we only receive the capital for three months of the year. Okay. Um, yeah, so that is the basic uh, explanation for, for Banos. Uh, right, so now let's have a look at this. So this is our calculation. When we're doing uh, basic earnings per share, our calculation is earnings at the top, which we explained was profit or loss for ordinary shareholders. And then our, our numerator is Banos. Now, is, is EPS is simply a ratio. It's simply a ratio that is trying to say, if you held a share in this company, how much earnings do you have a right to? Not how much you received. Remember, how much you received would be dividends, right? How much you received would be dividends per share. But how much you have a right to would be profit for the year. That's how much you had a right to, okay? And it's basically a ratio where we put earnings at the top and we divide earnings by Vanos to get an amount of rands per share. Okay, so we get an amount of rands per share. Um, earnings divided by Wanos will give us rands per share, which we then call basic earnings per share. Okay, everybody understand? Give me a thumbs up if you understand what we did so far. Okay, good. Okay, so like we said, uh, so now we're going to look in a little bit deeper into, into our earnings per share. So like we said, um, with earnings per share, um, it's only for ordinary shareholders. Okay, we've got that, right? So it's only for ordinary shareholders, we must exclude everyone else. When we, uh, when we uh, therefore, right, because we're excluding all other shareholders, uh, all other types of equity, when we are calculating our WANOS, we must also only use ordinary shares. That's why if you look at the word WANOS, it says here, uh, number of ordinary shares. So they're specifically looking and focusing in on ordinary shares. Now, if we say we're excluding um, preference shares, then would it, make, would it not make sense that we also exclude the dividends that belongs to the preference shareholders. Because obviously, if they are receiving, if the, if the preference shareholders are supposed to receive dividends, they, it can't be for the ordinary shareholders, right? Because remember, they're given preference over the ordinary shareholders. So, so if the preference shareholders are receiving a dividends, do you understand that it makes sense for us to remove that dividends from the, from the profit before we start calculating uh, EPS. Does that make sense to everyone? Right. So we, we start off with profit. Um, um, we then need to remove any preference dividends because it, the preference dividends to the ordinary shareholders. And we in EPS, we focusing in on the ordinary shareholders. So we want to remove any uh, uh, preference share dividends. Okay. Now, remember, we're not dealing with participating preference shares, so we don't need to worry about a variable dividends. We only need to worry about fixed dividends. Okay. Uh, everybody understands so far, right? So if you don't understand, please, 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 please put up your hand because um, it's critical that we get the ground done properly. Okay. Now, remember, we've got um, cumulative shares, right? Cumulative preference dividends. Uh, uh, and the cumulative preference dividends, regardless of whether you declare it or not, you have to accrue for it. Because if you don't uh, pay it, right, if you don't pay it or if you don't declare it, it accumulates. That's why the word is accumul accumulative um, uh, preference shares or cumulative preference dividends, because you can have what we call dividends in arrears, okay? Now, in um, our calculation, we're going to start off when we're doing, so, so we're calculating earnings now, right? So we're calculating earnings, the numerator, right? So that's why we've got the numerator. We're going to start off, off with profit after tax, okay? Remember, we've, we're not taking into account 
any OCI or any NCI, so any um, other comprehensive income or any uh, non-controlling interests. And then we want to minus, right? We want to minus our preference dividends. Now, what can that preference dividends be? What makes up the preference dividends? That's why my arrow is there, right? So I say the preference dividends, it, it needs to be the cumulative dividends, right? And we always gonna take it out regardless of whether it's been declared or paid. But what amount do we take out? We only must take out the amount for the current year. Okay, we must only take out the amount for the current year. Okay, now what happens if they uh, declared or paid um, um, any arrears in the current year? We still only take into account the current year. Why? Because in the creation or in the generation of this year's profit, right? We can't now start accounting for what happened last year, okay? As, because it's in arrears, it was already accounted for in last year's calculation. So we need to take it into account only the current year. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so in both cases, whether, they've, whether there's no arrears or whether there is arrears, we only need to take into account the current year. Okay. Um, now, with non-accumulative dividends, uh, preference share dividends, remember that um, the the company can avoid this dividends if they don't declare it. So, if in the case of non uh, non-accumulative preference dividends, now no dividends was declared in the current year, then we must not take it out. Or in the only case in which we'll take um, um, non-accumulative preference dividends is if the company has declared it, right? So that's easy. So with cumulative dividends, we take it into account regardless of whether it was paid or, or declared. With non-accumulative dividends, we only take it into account uh, if it was declared. And we only, in both of these cases, we only take into account the current year. Okay, so it's, 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 it's simple. It, they're simple rules, but we need to remember them. We need to write them down so that we remember them, okay? Okay, so any questions so far? Does everybody understand? Um, give me a thumbs up if you, if you understand. If you're lost, please, please, please tell me. Okay, one person seems to be on track. Is everyone else okay? Okay, good. So that's earnings. That's the basic explanation for earnings, right? So we, we have already done the numerator. Okay, was that hard? I don't think it was. It was very basic. So the, so the most important thing with uh, the numerator is, is the preference shares, right? And also remembering to exclude NCI, non-controlling interests, and also remembering to exclude um, OCI, right? Or, or other comprehensive income. Okay, so now let's move on and talk about the WANOS. So the numerator, the bottom number, right? So the WANOS. Um, with the WANOS, again, in a case where we have received some sort of um, uh, capital in part, for part of the year, we only were able to use that capital uh, for a specific period of time within the year. Therefore, we need to weight it. And we always, in, for back to 100, we're always going to weight it by months, right? We need to weight it for a time factor for the amount of time that we had the capital available. Okay, so that's why I said we need to, we, we only had the resources for part of the year, and the resources were therefore only allowed to affect profit for part of the year because remember remember what they'll do right when they get capital when companies get capital they will use it to generate profit so if they only got it in the middle of the year they could only use it to generate profit from the time that they received it so therefore it doesn't make sense it, it, we're not comparing apples to apples when we uh, if we don't apportion and we don't uh, uh, weight it. The word the word that we use is weight, but for us, I think most students understand what the word apportion means. Um, okay. 
So we 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 need to uh, wait it for for the number of time or the or the amount of time that it was an issue. Uh, in the case where we have uh, um, share capital that was receivable, so we issued the shares. We're still waiting for the company to to. Uh, we're still waiting for the shareholder to give us the the. Um, uh, mon the actual money, we can still wait it from that time because we, in effect, right, are the shareholders' uh, um, uh, debtor. No? Yes, we, in, sorry, we in effect, are the shareholders' creditor, and that specific shareholder is our debtor, so we, we have an increase in assets, okay? So because we have some sort of increase in assets, there's, uh, there's more uh, uh, money, that the pie has gotten bigger, uh, we can still wait it for the period of time that it has been received. The key is we need to look at the date that it was issued from, right? So the date that the shares were allocated, the date that the shares have been in issue from, and on that date is the date that we wait the shares. Um, any questions? Does everybody understand why we wait it? Do you understand the reasoning behind the fact that if we had the capital for part of the year, therefore it can only affect the profit for part of the year, and therefore we need to wait it, right? So do you understand that? Give me a thumbs up if you understand the reasoning behind why we are waiting Vanos. Give me a thumbs up in the chat. Okay. Okay, cool. That's good. Now, you guys would remember uh, from Tuesday's lecture, um, that we said we can have two types of uh, ways in which we can issue shares, right? There's two broad ways in which we can issue shares. The first way is if we say to someone, please come and buy. And when you buy our shares, you must uh, give us some money in return, right? So that type of issue is called a four value issue. So why is it called a four value issue? Because we're giving the share in return for some money, for some value, right? Sometimes it doesn't always need to be cash. Sometimes people can even give us assets, okay? Our purpose is in back to 100, we, it's always gonna be cash. It's always gonna be money, right? But just to, to let you know that it can be other forms of value. But for back to 100, it's always gonna be cash. So we're giving them a share and they in return are giving us um, a cash, okay? So what we would do in that case is we would wait it for the period in which we received uh, uh, the, 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 the money. So, so the current period in which the issue happened is the, year, is the year that we will wait it for. Now, when we look at the prior year, does it make sense for us to uh, make a change in the prior year? Um, for a four value issue? And the answer is no, we won't make a change. When I say restate, I'm saying we change the prior year numbers. We won't make that change because we actually, those specific shares did not exist in the prior year. They weren't an issue in the prior year. Okay, does that make sense? So we wouldn't actually change anything. Uh, when I say competitors, again, I'm talking about prior years. So we wouldn't actually change anything in the prior year for for value issue. Now, let's contrast that with not for value issue or no value shares, right? Not for value issue shares, uh, and we're only dealing with one, right? Remember when we, on Tuesday's lecture, we spoke about share splits and share Don't worry about that for EPS. For EPS, we only going to be the only thing you're going to get is a capitalization issue. Okay, that's the only one I'm going to test you on. So, a capitalization issue. What we're basically saying is you are holding one share. Let's say you're holding uh, one share, and I say if you are a shareholder and you have one share, I will give you another share for free for bonus. Right? I'm going to give it to you for nothing. You're not going to pay for it. As a result of you not paying, right, that is a no value issue. Does that make sense? So there's no value, it's not for value, there's no increase in the pie, the pie is not becoming bigger, okay? So that's a no value issue. There's no exchange of cash, and remember, there's no debit back. 
Um, so, so there's no exchange of cash. Instead, we are just giving them the share. Now, the question that I have for you is, what is the originating uh, thing that gave rise to the share? Right? The person earned or got this additional share, this new capitalization share, the person got this by mere fact of them holding the share. Right? And as a result of that uh, uh, share that they held being in existence already, we now need to restate the prior year. We do, will not wait the current year, right? Because we didn't receive any increase in, 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 in cash. The pie didn't get bigger. But we need to restate the prior year because the um, specific thing that caused this uh, uh, capitalization, that share that was in existence already, was already in existence in the prior year. Okay. So we need to restate, meaning we need to change the prior year. Does everybody understand uh, that reasoning? Do you understand that reasoning? If you do, please give me a thumbs up, right? So uh, if you, uh, for, for those who just want it simple, right? So most students, they don't care about, uh, they, they will say to me, sir, you know, it's nice to know the reasoning, but if I don't get the reasoning, I just want to pass the exam. So if you're one of those students, just want to pass the exam, all you need to know is, um, for four, when we have an issue that's for value, we weight it in the current period, right? So that's what I've said here, where the plus is. I weight it in the current period, and we do not restate the prior year. When we have a, 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 a not for value, a no value issue, we don't weight it in the current period, right? So we don't, that's why there's don't there underlined. We don't weight it in the current period, and we do change. The prior year. Okay, so we do change what's called the comparatives. Okay, so very simple, but uh, for those of us that want to understand the, the, the mechanics and the reasoning behind it, that, that was the mechanics. Okay, so again, this, this slide here is just uh, uh, sort of uh, setting it out and reiterating. We can have something that's called a no, uh, we can have something that's called a, a four value issue. The share is given out for the fair value amount of the share. We can have a no value issue where the share is given away for free. And then there's this other thing called a combination issue uh, where it's given out for either less than, uh, well, it's given out always for less than the fair value. But on this specific uh, thing here, we are not going to put it back to 100. It's not going to be tested, right? But I just wanted to include it in the slide so that you're aware that that is possible. Now, I do understand that we're slightly behind time. We've got about three slides left, um, and then we'll be done with this lecture, right? So just stick with me. Um, so someone um, has a, a comment here. So they say, the share already exists for the no fair, fair value. Yeah, so, the, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to say in this, let me go back to that slide, if you don't mind, guys. I just want to... Uh, uh, it's better for you guys to see it. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that um, when we have a no value issue, the thing that created that capitalization share, the thing that created that new share was an ordinary share that was already in issue. And because that ordinary share was already in issue, we technically have... Uh, we technically had already received the capital that related to that capitalization share. Okay, so, so we've got two shares. We've got ordinary shares. We've got capitalization shares. We say to, to people, we don't really have two types. I'm just, it's just for explanation purposes, right? So we say to people, if, you've got, if you're already holding an ordinary share, I'm going to give you a capitalization share, right? So technically, the capital that relates to that additional, that new share was already received when the original share was purchased. Does that make sense? I don't know whether I've... Um, right? So the capital that was received in relation to that capitalization share was received when they purchased the original share. Um, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Right, so, so we're almost done. 
uh, let me just go back. I just want to find my spot again. Just give me a minute. Right. So um, now when we so this this slide again is just I want to I want to drill this home. If we get, get new money, new what we'll call resources or new value, we wait the shares in the current year, right? So that's why I said in the current period, by a factor of time, uh, by a factor of time, meaning by the amount of months that the, that the uh, uh, new money was available. So like I said just now, if we have a, a, a January to December year end, right? So a year runs from January to, to December. If we gave the, if we issued the new shares on the 1st of October, Right, on 1 October, then we would have the money for three months and the additional shares would be weighted for those three months. So we'd say however many shares we issued times three divided by 12. Right, So that's the weighting that we're doing. We are portioning it and we're saying we received the money, but we only received it for three months. Therefore, the profit would have only been affected for three months by these new shares. So then we wait the number of shares that we, we issued times three over 12. Okay. Um, and we don't, so again, I'm reiterating in the slide here, we don't restate the comparatives for a four value. Remember, this is for a four value issue. Okay. Now I've put a little calculation here. I'm hoping that you guys can use this calculation. And I've said, if we have an opening balance, we wouldn't wait an opening balance, right? Because we've had that, the, the that relates to that opening balance. We've had it from the beginning of the year. So there's no need to wait it, okay? No need to wait this. So that's why I've said it's 12 divided by 12, which is one, which basically means the number stays the same. So we wouldn't wait it. But for new shares here, we say the number of shares times by the months that it's been available divided by 12. So we're apportioning it, we're waiting it. Right, and remember uh, the reason why we do that is because we've only had the money for a specific amount of time. Therefore, that money was only able to affect profit for a specific amount of time. Okay. Um, so this slide again, it's sort of, uh, uh, I think I explained too early in today's lecture, but again, what I'm trying to say in this slide is the reasoning behind uh, why we need to wait it is because there was an inflow of cash or there was an inflow of capital that only got used or was only available at a specific time in the year. And because of that, it was only able to affect profit for a specific time in the year. And therefore, we could um, we, we need to wait it uh, because otherwise uh, the profit that we got was affected by it only for three months. Uh, and if we don't wait it, then we assuming that the profit was affected for the whole year. And that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Um, so I'm just going to look at the chat now for some questions. It says uh, been available from the day we received the money for it. Yes, uh, it's it's available from the day that it was issued. Right. So sometimes we might have a situation where we issued the share, but we have what's called a receivable. Right. Uh, but as long as it was issued to the shareholder, there would, would be a change in resources. So in the case where uh, there's a receivable, there's a new asset that's arrived, right? In the case where we received the money, there's also a new asset that's, that's arrived, but it's in the form of bank. Um, uh, does that make sense to everyone? So in both instances, as long as the sh share was issued, um, as long as the share was issued, and there's been a change in the asset base, right? So in, in one case, we get we get a new debtor. In the other case, we get a new uh, extra cash, extra bank. So there's, so there's a debit bank in the other case. OK, um, so again, we need to wait it for the number of time that the, that the capital had increased. So if it increased for three months, we need to wait the number of shares for three months because it was only able to affect profit for three months. And then um, uh, this goes on to, to say, um, sort of the same thing. We only were able to increase our capacity. When I say, when I use the word capacity, I'm saying our ability to create profit, right? We are only able to increase our capacity to create profit 
for a specific amount of months and and therefore profit would have only been affected for a specific amount of months let's say three months uh, and it would not make sense if we did not weight the shares because if we did not weight the shares we saying in effect that the profit was affected for the whole year and that that doesn't it just doesn't make sense it gives a false impression um, um, yeah okay um, does anyone have any questions about why we weight the shares uh, or when or at all? Do you have any questions about that? Because I know we went through it a little bit fast, but does is everyone up to speed? Okay. Now, if someone says yes in the chat and you don't understand, you must still feel free to say, um, Listen, I don't understand because um, you know sometimes we it can happen, right? So so it can happen. Um, okay, so guys, so that's basically the end of today's lecture. Um, but um, I want to just leave us so so we do have an example left that we are supposed to do in today's lecture, but I'm not going to do it now because um, we a bit short on time. But also I want to leave you with that. Uh, um, explanation that we weight the shares because we only received the money for a specific amount of time. And when we received the money, we were not able to affect profit for the whole year. We we're only able to affect profit for part of the year. Okay. So, so that's the important bits. Um, if I were to highlight anything, if I were to sort of uh, uh, tell you about anything that you need to take away, if you had to take away from this lecture, I think the most important things that you're going to want to take away is that um, uh, the, from earnings, um, just a brief summary now I'm giving you. <laughs> from earnings, um, it must be profit, so not OCI, and it must be only for ordinary shareholders, so not preference shares, not NCI. And then um, when we're taking out the, the dividends, remember, I'm going to highlight it again, it must only be for the current year. Right, whether it's in arrears or not, and under non-accumulative, it must only be when declared. All right, so that's uh, basically it, and you guys understand why we're waiting the shares. Now, when we come back um, tomorrow, please, can you guys go over and read the class examples? The class examples are in um, on ClickUp.